Hello, everybody, and welcome to EM's third webinar. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at EM's product portfolio for field sensing and switching devices. Um, for those of you who've joined some of our previous sessions, you will know the host, uh, William. He's a seasoned Electromechanica EM employee and product manager for drives, automation, and sensing. So that's your categories A2, C, and K in the Electromechanica catalog. Um, just next slide, William. Just before we dive into the webinar, just some rules or, or some functions that's available to you um, to reduce any lag in the webinar. The, your videos and microphones have been muted and switched off. Um, if you have any general comments you need to make, you can use the chat function on the bottom toolbar. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand if you want to ask it verbally, or you can use the Q&A function on the bottom toolbar. Um, this live webinar will be available afterwards via an email, which will be sent to all registered email addresses that attended. Um, we also have a poll, a webinar poll at the end of the session. Um, this will help us improve your overall experience and our, our professionalism. So please just take a few minutes of your time afterwards to complete the poll. Um, today's goal is to help you gain a deeper understanding of field switching devices and safety systems. This is, can be quite a complex field. There's a host of different technologies um, when it comes to sensors and safety devices in and of themselves are complex devices with, with quite stringent and strict rules around applications and, and installations. So we really, we want to hopefully give you a better understanding of both sensing and a bit of the safety device. Over to you, William. Thank you, Conrad. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope uh, today is going to be a nice interactive session. Um, I do welcome questions. I'm here to learn as, as much as anyone else. So please, uh, your experiences are most welcome. Just to, to have a brief look at the contents of the day, we're going to be looking at um, some, some basic theory of inductive proxies and, and what we have to offer. The same with capacitive proxies, uh, some basic theory and offering. After that, we'll move over to photoelectric sensors. Um, we'll hone in on a special focus on our new fork sensors we have available. Um, and then some ultrasonic sensors and our Huber pressure transducer range as well. We'll have a small interval, and after the interval, we'll move over to machine safety, safety design, and our safety offering, also new to our 2020 catalog. Um, if you can, guys, please have your 2020 catalogs on hand. From time to time, um, there will be a, you'll be asked to go to a specific page, just to add a deeper reference uh, to, the, to the slide we, we, we're discussing. All right, let's go. I always like to start at the beginning. So let's start with some inductive proxy theory. So the electrical current flows inside of an oscillating magnetic field inside the inductive proxy's head. When an object uh, comes closer to that proxy's uh, detection head or the, the head of the proxy, the, the induced eddy currents into that object, obviously a metal object, will cause the oscillation amplitude to fall. As the eddy currents get induced inside the object, the oscillation will fall. The, the lowering of this amplitude will trigger the sensor's um, output to activate. This is a quite important uh, fact because it means that only metallic objects are detected by an inductive proxy. No wood, no water, glass, anything else may be flying around, oils, it does not affect the, 
the detection of the proxy. Looking at the sensing range of the various proximity sensors, you'll note that the sensing range of any proxy is based on um, a particular target. Now that target is defined as a square of soft steel that's one millimeter thick. The length or the, the, the size of the square of soft steel um, used as a, as a standard target will differ according to the proximities gauge. So basically, um, there's two types of, of standards. If the proximities diameter is bigger than three times the sensing distance, then you would use the proxy's diameter as your standard target length. So in other words, an eight more proxy has a two millimeter sensing distance. The diameter is three times bigger than the sensing distance. Therefore, the standard target for an eight mole proxy is eight mole length on each side of the square. Alternate for an M30 sensor with a sensing distance of 15 millimeters. Um, here, the sensing distance, three times the sensing distance, is larger than the diameter of the proxy. So three times sensing distance is used as the square um, dimensions for the standard target. In that case, it will be 45 millimeters as a standard target. So with this in mind, you, you will probably see that if a proxy says two millimeters or eight millimeters as a sensing distance, that might deviate slightly according to the correction factor that you can apply to different materials, as well as the thickness of the material as well. Um, it also can contribute to, um, to the actual sensing distance. Looking at flush and non-flush proximities or shielded or non-shielded proxies, um, the two different terminologies mean the same thing. Shielded models or the flush models have the sensitive part housed inside of the proximity um, uh, sensor. So this allows us to mount it flush with the machine surface because it doesn't detect out the sides, it'll only detect out the front. Alternate, the non-shielded proxy has a wider detection area around the side, so it cannot be mounted flush inside of the machine surface, otherwise it will stay on as it will detect the machine surface. Non-flush proxies typically have double the sensing distance of um, the shielded proxy. Here's a table to show us our uh, proximity offering we have. There are three different suppliers um, that you can buy inductive proximities from us um, and these suppliers are spread across our catalogue. So uh, a large part of today is just to highlight uh, different options from the various suppliers and pinpointing um, pros and cons of, of either of, of them. Um, so you can obviously see by the table that our main brand is microdetectors. We have from M4 all the way to M30, including analog proxies and, and small rectangular proxies as well. Multi voltages also are available with the microdetector range. With the Delta proximities, we only do the M12, M18, and then with IECO, we only have the large rectangular proximities in that range. You'll also note here that uh, we have added food and beverage types to the M12 and M18 in microdetectors. And that's with the 316 stainless steel. So that's our proximity offering broken down by size. So this is one of the occasions where we need to compare across the catalog so that um, we can choose the correct proxy for the correct application. Sometimes perhaps size is um, a determining factor, sometimes price is a determining factor. So I just want to highlight these options um, for you. If I look at the Delta and the MD proxies, the long sensing distance, as it's called. Uh, for shielded models, long sensing distance is 4 mil, and non-shielded is 8 mil, and the same with the Delta. 
So if I'm comparing apples with apples, I'm comparing long sensing distance MD versus the Delta brand. You'll note that uh, the Delta is quite a lot, uh, you save quite a lot in terms of um, the list price on the Delta units if you're comparing long, long sensing distance with long sensing distance. Um, alternatively, you could go for the MD shorter sensing distance and get closer to that Delta price but you sacrifice obviously on the sensing distance. Okay, that's the M18 pricing. Um, even more so, the Delta is much more competitive um, if you're comparing it versus the MD long sensing distance sensor. The Delta doesn't have it all its own way. If you look at the body length, um, and compare its body length versus the MD equivalent, you'll note that the MD is quite a lot shorter. So when going with, um, with going with dimensions as your primary, um, primary reason, then the MD is much more attractive than, than the Delta sensor. These are obviously spread across the catalog, page K1, K2, and then the Delta resides on page K12. The MD range is obviously a lot more comprehensive. We've got uh, shorter sensing distances, normally open and normally closed. Um, there's obviously the stainless steel versions for food and beverage. So the, the product range on the MD is much larger compared to the very small product range from Delta. But um, with a price like that, it, we felt to, to include it. All right, let's have a look at some capacitive proximity sensors. I'll we'll just touch on a bit of basic theory on this as well. So different to an inductive proxy, the capacitive uh, proximity generates an electrostatic field. So when an item gets closer to the, to the proximity, uh, the oscillator will start to, to oscillate more and more. And similar to the inductive proxy, once that oscillation goes past a certain threshold, the sensor can then turn on. And that sensitivity can be adjusted on the capacitive sensor. These types of sensors can detect just about anything. Um, it's largely dependent on the material's dielectric property, which means um, its, its ability to hold a, a charge, um, which is what the capacitive sensor uses for its detection. Here's a list of uh, just some dielectric properties of various materials. Um, you can see how they differ from water being 80, air being the base of, of one. Um, and you can see it, different properties um, have, are associated with different materials. Capacitive detection um, is quite unique in that you can actually detect through a product, like in this milk carton application, the proximity can be tuned to detect through the carton and the dielectric properties of the carton and the milk is what will trigger the capacitive proxy. If it's tuned correctly, the dielectric property of just the carton is not enough to activate the proxy. So in this case, you can push off um, the, the product that isn't full of milk and let the ones that are continue through to, to be packaged. Similar, you can also detect the, the presence of water through perspex or glass. Um, you can see perspex is only a dielectric of three and, and water has 80. So it will be easy to tune the proximity in that case to detect water um, on the inside of, of glass or, or perspex. All the proximities, the capacitive proximities, um, have a certain uh, teach or an adjustment pot. Um, the M12s have the teach button, and the M18 and M30 and the cubic type have potentiometer for sensitivity adjustment. This is just something, uh, it gave me a bit of a, a wow when I, when I realized it for the first time, so I thought I'll just add it in. It's yet another opposite, yet similar relationship between inductive and capacitive properties. Um, 
You can see how an inductive sensor behaves in the presence of a target and how a capacitive sensor behaves in the presence of a target. Um, just thought it would be a nice to include. Again, inductive is electromagnetic field and a capacitive operation is electrostatic field. All right, on to photoelectric sensors. Um, as you all might know, there are three main types of photoelectric sensors. Um, and these three, main, these three types um, are used in various applications um, um, and we'll highlight why and when we would use these. So our diffuse type is a photoelectric sensor that uses light reflected from the target back to its detection circuit to switch the unit on. Um, the diffuse type is easy to set up. There's no reflector required. Um, it has a relatively low sensing distance because it relies on the light being reflected by the target. So often the, the, the sensor has to be relatively close to the, to the target to, to be used. Um, and one of the great benefits is you can do direct object detection, like you can see on this picture here. Um, in this application where you're detecting something on a conveyor belt that's relatively flat, um, using a through beam or a reflective sensor would be more difficult to get right. The through beam type um, uses a beam of light from a transmitter to a receiver. When that beam is broken, then the, the transmitter will turn on. So it's the, the lack of light being received by the receiver will, will, will switch the transmitter. It has a much higher setup difficulty because you've got two proximities, one on each side of the conveyor, for instance. They, own, have the, they, they have their own separate electrical connections, which you need to then wire back to the station. And you obviously have to align these two uh, proximities to, to, to work together. So there's a little bit of extra wiring, slightly more difficult to set up, um, but one of the great benefits of this uh, type of technology is it's not affected by reflective objects. Um, so an object can be as reflective as it wants, it can be a mirror even. The through beam uh, technology will detect that being broken. On to retro reflective types. Uh, similar to the through beam, except we use a reflector to bounce light off a reflector and to break the target. It, compared to the above two, it's got a moderate setup difficulty. You don't really have to wire anything to, to the reflector, but you still have to mount it and position it. Um, you obviously need a reflector as well. Um, and this option is great for transparent bottle and object detection. We'll touch on that just now. Okay, so we're going to have a look at our photoelectric sensing sensor offering. We've got the M18 axial type. We've had that for quite a while. This is one of the new to the 2020 catalog is the 90 degree um, sensing M18 uh, photoelectric sensor. We've also got the small cubic type. What I call medium and large cubic type. These would take your, um, some with screws, relay outputs and multi-voltages. So you can run 220 volt onto these proxies and they've got a physical relay output, which makes um, installation a little bit easier. Some of the new sensors, um, high speed fork sensor, as well as a retro reflective area sensor. These are new to the catalog. We'll discuss the fork sensor a little bit later, like I mentioned in a, in a special focus. Um, we also have the ultra miniature sensor from Panasonic. As you can see, it's extremely small and obviously the fiber optic range to complement as well. And last but not least, the color mark and our laser displacement sensors. This is basically all our photoelectric offering that we have. So we're gonna compare again some of our photoelectric offerings. Again, we've got three different suppliers in, in this category um, to, to consider. Um, and again, they spread across the catalog, page K5, 
K14 and K12. So I want to highlight some pros and some cons. So uh, when it comes to selection, um, hopefully all can make a wiser choice. If we're looking at price as the main driving factor, um, the Panasonic CY121 on page K14 is a great option for the 100 millimeter sensing. There's nothing that really comes close to it. Um, also for a low cost version, it includes the M12 connector, which is massive. All the others that we're comparing are the cable type. So the CY121 from Panasonic with the M12 uh, connector is really, really well priced if you're sensing um, 100 moles and under. For the 300 to 600 millimeter, um, the Delta comes in quite cheap. I think the Delta is the 300 millimeter sensing. The FI-18 is a 400 millimeter sensing. And the 600 millimeter is then the Panasonic again. Um, so Panasonic sticks out to me in, in this case as well because it's got the M12 connector. It's also got sensitivity adjustment, 600 millimeters. Um, at not a bad price. But if price is your underlying factor, then the delta um, comes in quite good. On the one meter diffused, um, again, the delta option is very attractive. It doesn't come with sensitivity adjustment like the MD, but if price is your underlying reason, then um, the delta is worth consideration. Looking at the retro reflective type, in the M18. The Delta Retro Reflective is quite attractive because it includes a reflector and all the brackets, where the Panasonic 192 um, has the M12 connector and has a relatively low price as well. Looking at the polarized version, again, um, we have quite a close competition between the FI-18 MD and the Panasonic CY-121. And then last but not least, our through beam option. Um, again, the Panasonic um, comes out quite good with the through beam. And again, to mention that it has M12 as well um, on the through beam sensors. So M18 photoelectric, uh, consider using Panasonic, it's quite competitive on the price. Um, MD is a great option because there's a wide product range from 90 degree uh, background suppression, etc. cetera. Um, and Delta is also there um, competing with the Panasonic. So the few variations I wanted to highlight, K, K12, K14, and K5, um, all have similar products over there. Onto the diffused. These are our cubic type sensors. We're gonna highlight the diffuse type. So here the Delta comes out trumps uh, really good on price, but economical with a cable attachment only. Where the Panasonic and the MD options both have M8 plugs. The Delta has a cable attachment. You'll note quickly on the background suppression um, photoelectric sensors, the MD has a great price for background suppression compared to the Panasonic. However, the Panasonic uses a slightly different technology on the CX44 uh, units, where that uses a type of triangulation. So it, it doesn't really use light in a sense, but more distance to detect uh, the target. So by using this type of technology, the, the object that you're sensing, um, the sensor doesn't mind the color um, or background or foreground um, noise that's happening. It can also detect an object 0 0.4 millimeters above a conveyor, for instance. So it's a really accurate spot detection, uh, very repeatable and very accurate. 
with a minimum of two millimeter sensing distance, say compared to the 30 millimeter of the MD background suppression unit. So yes, the MD is a lot better for a simple background suppression offering, but the Panasonic um, takes it a step further and allows you to really focus in on a very small object um, with the diffuse type sensor. Again, if it's price you're after, then Delta is a very good option. Looking at the retroreflective, again on the three to 4.2 meter, Delta is a good option. Um, not only is the uh, price a lot lower, it also comes with all the brackets and the reflector as well. Where on the other options, MD and Panasonic, you would have to add um, those accessories. All right. The through beam type, uh, 10 to 12 meters, we've got a delta option that comes in very good. The 20 meter, we've got an MD option, and 30 meter, we've got a Panasonic CX41 option. Again, spread across the catalog, and I hope these tables um, can make you find the correct sensor um, to use for each application. All right, I said I'll, we'll chat about um, transparent object detection. Um, in our catalog, we've got two types of sensors specialized for transparent object detection. Uh, the MD is on page K6, and the Panasonic would be on K, excuse me, K17. So these are the only two um, products that I would advise for transparent bottle or object, object detection. It's possible to get away with uh, perhaps a conventional retroreflective sensor for a transparent bottle, but you, you run the, the risk of, of not detecting the bottle, particularly when the, the light enters the center of the bottle. Um, often you might find the sensor will see the, the, the edge rising and the edge of the bottle falling but um, it might give you um, no signal once the beam goes through the bottle. So obviously the, the transparent uh, sensors negate that. We've tested it profusely and they work extremely well. The reason why ref retroreflective is preferred for transparent detection is that the light beam passes through the bottle twice. If you're using a through beam system, obviously the light beam only passes through once. By allowing the light to pass through the bottle twice, it gives that reflected light um, the, the greatest distortion possible, which would um, help the, the sensor in detecting the presence of a bottle. So these are the only two sensors I would advise for transparent bottle detection. Um, the MD comes out uh, better on price, but the Panasonic has a much closer sensing distance uh, capability. So again, you've got to play up your options. If you're sensing close to a conveyor, maybe the Panasonic is slightly better. If you um, can sense 0.4 or further, then perhaps the MD is the better option for you. Both of these sensors accept the M8 plugs as well. William, is that for empty bottles only or bottles filled with clear liquid as well? I've only tested on empty bottles, Conrad, um, but I imagine if it's a, a clear liquid like water, then the same would apply. It would probably be easier to detect with water, seeing as the light will get refracted probably a lot more. Um, so I assume that bottles with uh, water inside would be uh, a lot easier to detect. Um, still advise to use a transparent uh, detector though. Good question. Thank you. So just to look at some of the special sensors, um, quickly highlight them. The Panasonic Alex 101, that's on page K18, um, can detect different colors. You can tune it to, to select different colors. Great for high-speed mark um, detection applications. The EXL200 laser sensor, also on K18, you can use that to detect very fine objects. 
um, down to a cross section of 0 0.01 millimeters. So a, a very small piece of wire perhaps you can detect. And then last but not least, the HGC laser distance sensors. These have a very um, high accuracy of measurement down to 0 0.01 millimeters repeatability. So they are there to detect distance um, very accurately. Just an acronym that, uh, again, when I found out what it meant, it just gave me that aha moment. Laser actually means light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. That's the laser. Okay, so we're going to hone in on our special focus, the uh, fork sensors. These are new to our catalog. On page K10, we'll see the range of fork sensors near the bottom. Um, the fork sensors, the FC series, uh, FC5 and FC6, they are um, fast switching, so they can handle a, a very high frequency of, of product going through the um, going through the forks. M8 connectors for easy installation, and then the FC5 and the FC6 are the two options we have in these types of sensors, where the FC5 doesn't have any sensitivity adjustment, and the FC6 does. You can obviously see in, in the fork sensor, choosing the correct dimensions is very important to obviously um, fit the product size. So looking at the, the slot width, the depth of the forks, it's uh, very important to choose the right type. Those are new FC5 and FC6 fork sensors. We've also included a label uh, fork sensor, the FC7. That's right at the bottom of page K10. Um, this is also a high speed um, fork sensor used to detect the position of labels. Uh, we have quite a strong solution when it comes to label um, labeling machines. Um, so I'm gonna highlight and dig a little bit deeper on, on this type of application. So these FC7 sensors can detect a minimum of two millimeters between labels, as well as a minimum label of two millimeters itself. I've never seen a label two millimeters uh, wide, um, or even the gap between the labels is generally a lot bigger than two millimeters. So the sensor um, should be able to cover a lot of applications um, when it comes to labeling. So this is my attempt to explain the operation of a typical labeling machine as we've done in the past. Um, like I've said before, we have a very strong solution when it comes to labeling. So hopefully I can elaborate a little bit more. On a typical labeling machine, your, your, your bottle, your unlabeled bottle would move down a conveyor. Um, and once that bottle is detected by a photoelectric sensor normally, um, it'll send a signal to the server drive. The server drive will then start pulling the label off the reel and position it. Once the fork sensor detects that rising edge or the falling edge of that label starting or ending, it, it switches on and it sends that signal to the server drive. The server drive will then capture that position of when that sensor turned on um, and store that position um, either inside the PLC or perhaps inside of the server drive, depending on, on your solution. So once the, the drive or the system knows the position of the, the, the slot where the fork sensor switched on, it knows to add on the offset. So, take the position where I'm at right now and add on the correct amount of distance so I can position the label perfectly so that the bottle and the label can be taken um, at, the right, at the right length. So the server will continue to move the label into position until it's applied to the bottle perfectly. And obviously by using this type of system, the, the PLC or the server drive can um, 
how can I say, correct each and every single movement can be recorrected by the detection of that label width. So even if there's a little slight misalignment of the label on the reel, the, the fork sensor and the server drive will continuously compensate for any error that might be in the system. Again, we have a, a very good uh, labeling machine solution. Um, from the small DVP PLCs, we have built-in label, um, labeling instructions, as well as the, the newer AS PLCs, uh, all the small micro drives for the conveyor systems, the photoelectric sensors, you name it. Very, very strong labeling machine solution. This is one of the machines we did uh, some time back, just to give you an overall view on, on what I was talking about. Oops. Apologies. So obviously the, the process happens a lot faster than my six steps. Um, that's all handled by the, the high speed fork sensor and, and the server drive and PLC combination. It's a typical labeling machine, fork sensor, PLC and server drive. Um, an honorable mention, the FC8 fork sensor um, this unit didn't make the catalog, but um, I thought I'd mention it seeing as we're on the, the topic of label sensors. The FC8 is a ultrasonic type label detection sensor, also a fork sensor, excuse me. Um, but this sensor is really suited to detect transparent labels. So um, labels where a through beam sensor would wouldn't really be able to tell if, the, if there's backing or a label because of the label being transparent. Um, here you would go with a ultrasonic fork sensor. This sensor actually measures the distance. So if there's a label or if there's a backing. And that detection accuracy is about 0.2 millimeters. So as so long as your label is thicker than 0.2 millimeters, then the ultrasonic sensor will be able to detect the presence of a label or the backing itself. And that's how it will decide um, the, the stopping position for the server drive in the system. That's the FC8, not in the catalog. We have access to it. If you have any transparent labeling uh, solutions that you need to do, we can bring in the FC8. Uh, this also has a two millimeter minimum distance between labels and a minimum label distance of two millimeters as well. Okay, we're gonna change the subject over to our ultrasonic sensors, page K9. Um, a lot of you might have noticed that we've really increased the ultrasonic range quite a lot. Um, we've included the new cubic type sensors, as you can see over here, as well as increased the range um, and included the UT5, which can do up to eight meters. Um, measuring distance. You can see UT1, UT2, and UT5 are all M30, but have different size heads depending on 3.56 or 8 meter sensing distance. So for you who don't know, ultrasonic sensor sends out a sound wave, and the time that sound wave takes to bounce off the target and reflect back to the sensor that's how the sensor uses to determine the actual distance of the target. Similar to a dolphin. So if you need to measure the level um, and you can't make contact with the medium, uh, maybe like sewage water or, or grain or something like that, then ultrasonic sensor um, is a great solution to, to go for.
Looking at our uh, pressure transducers, K23, we've got quite a range of pressure transducers. I'm going to highlight the 528 and the 520 type, they're the most popular. Two main differences between the 528 and the 520 is in the seal and the overload tolerance of the two transducers. So the 528 um, has an elastomer seal um, and can tolerate around 2.5 to three times full scale pressure. So if it's uh, say bigger than four bar um, pressure transducer, it can handle 2.5 times that rated pressure. The 520 on the other hand has a welded seal um, and it can go up to 600 bars because of that. And also the tolerable overload has increased because of, of that welded seal technology. The 520 is also um, preferred for refrigeration applications um, if you're using ammonia or other refrigerants, seeing as the welded seal won't perish um, with those gases present. You can see the typical um, four, to, four to 20 milliamp curves um, from zero to minus one or from zero to your positive pressure is your typical four to 20 milliamps. Um, there are also customizable ranges if you require, Huber has the facilities to customize these ranges. So maybe 12 to 20 or four to 10 million, these are all possible as well, through special requests, obviously. So the 520 and the 540 are suited for just about every application, including refrigeration where the 528 and the 548 um, are suited for most applications, really besides refrigeration, if you're using ammonias and other refrigerants like that. So for the refrigeration side, uh, we've brought in some special transducers because of uh, demand. Um, these are the 520 types I've highlighted here, and they come with quarter inch 18 NPT threaded, uh, thread, sorry. Um, this again is by demand from our refrigeration clients that this is more of their industry standard. Um, so you'll see that our standard threads are G quarter in the catalog, but we have additional stock that we do keep for our refrigeration clients, which is quarter 18 NPT. And for those who don't know, NPT is your national pipe thread and it is slightly tapered compared to a parallel thread of say the, the G quarter that we, we stock as a standard. There are obviously a lot of other types of threads available. Um, UNF is another um, popular one for refrigeration. Um, and there's actually too many to mention, inside and outside threads available. Again, we standardize on G quarter and we do stock a small amount of quarter inch NPT as well. Page K25, just a brief overview of our differential pressure transducers. Now differential is just the meaning between the difference between two measurements. Um, so these sensors would typically have two pressure uh, measurement points, P1 and P2. In the case of a, a 699 transducer, this is used to detect um, differences in air pressure you would say use this transducer for um, stairwell pressurization. So with the drive connected to a, um, a blower fan, you would be able to keep a positive pressure inside a stairwell compared to the rest of the building. Uh, this is important for, for fire systems um, that smoke um, doesn't uh, tend to enter in a, a positive pressurized system. So if there is a fire and you're on the top floor, uh, the stairwell would um, stay smoke free and allow you to obviously escape. Um, that's very important for a lot of fire systems. So you would see 699 being used in conjunction with a, a variable speed drive to maintain that, that positive pressure. As a door or two are opened to go into the stairwell, the pressure might, might equalize and the VSD will obviously speed up to, to compensate. 
Um, also, the 692, you could use it on a, on a filter system to, say, measure when a, a filter maybe needs to be changed um, by measuring the difference in pressure from P2 to P1. Um, as the filter starts to block up, the, the pressure differential will increase at a certain threshold. It's time to change the filter. That's just one application where it could be used. So those are differential type uh, pressure transmitters. All right, gents, it's uh, that time already. I'm gonna have a small interval. And after the interval, uh, we'll continue with our safety products. Um, but during the interval, I'm gonna leave you with an introduction into some of those safety products. So I hope you enjoy. Oh, do that to me again. Here we go. All right, 
Um, let's continue. I hope you enjoyed that little introduction to RIA's Mosaic M1 and M1S uh, programmable safety relays. Sorry, William. Yes. Just a question relating back to the 520 pressure sensor with the NPT thread. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, go. Are they listed in the catalog or is it a out of catalog item? No, yeah. I'm um, sorry, I didn't make it clear. They are out of catalog item. Um, so the part numbers you see top right corner, um, they are on the system. It's just not in the catalog. As you can see in the catalog, everything is G quarter. These are um, extra 520 units we're bringing in to, to complement the refrigeration market. Um, some guys in refrigeration use the G quarter, but um, I've heard it from multiple people, uh, Joburg, Cape Town, Durban, that they prefer the NPT. So we've started to bring these in as well. Cool. So they're not in the catalog, but we do have them available. All right. So on to understanding safety. Um, it's a quite a difficult topic, but a very interesting one as well. So I hope you will stay with me on this. So safety levels, um, there are two main standards, your, your PL or performance level, A, B, all the way to E, which is the highest, and then your SIL, safety integral level. Um, those are kind of two separate standards, but they really mean the same thing. Um, and this table basically relates the two standards to each other. So SIL 3 is equivalent to say a PLE uh, rating. Now our safety devices is really rated by um, what they call probability of dangerous failure per hour. So a device of the highest standard, a PLE device, um, has a probability of failing per hour of 10 to the minus eight. And it's like one in, I don't know, 10 million, I guess, uh, chance of failing. Um, so it's a very reliable device. It obviously has a lot of uh, redundancy circuitry inside of it to, to help get to that type of um, performance level. Um, and we're gonna be explaining a little bit more about that as we, we go ahead. So also important to note that a, a safety system is really only as strong as its weakest link. So if, if your whole system is made up of PL, PLE devices, um, from controllers and actuators, but you've got one sensor that's a PLD, and then the whole system conforms to a PLD standard. Um, also something to consider um, when designing. So your safety level is really equivalent to, to, to break it down into simple terms, uh, a warning sign, an attention sign, a caution sign, or a danger sign. Are you going to... Um, burn your fingers and then recover after that? Or are you going to perhaps chop off your finger? Or are you perhaps going to lose an entire hand, arm, or even worse, your life? So that's how you would decide um, what type of safety level you would require by starting at this point and asking the basic questions to decide your, your PL standard. That's one way to get to, to the answer. This is a very important fact about safety design, um, particularly when you're using non-safety related machine control equipment. Um, for instance, um, sad but true, our Delta PLCs that we offer, we don't have a safety uh, control input. We don't have a safety related um, option for the PLCs. So in that case, um, you have to insert the protective equipment in between the, the control of the PLC and the machine primary control element. So in other words, if this was a, a press, for instance, the PLC can be doing all the movements of the press and all the interlocking of, of the entire machine. But if the safety light curtain is broken of that press, um, that safety light curtain mustn't go into an input of the PLC and have the PLC um, say turn off the main motor. The safety relay itself must deactivate the main motor. It must operate autonomously to the PLC. That is the correct way of inserting a safety device into your machine control. 
obviously, if you had a safety input PLC, um, those safety devices can go into the PLC and the PLC's output can then turn on or off the, the primary control. This mode, however, is the most common. A non-standard PLC or a non-safety PLC with the control relay or control device inserted in between the control and the, the primary uh, control element of the machine, be it a hydraulic pump or um, a, a motor for an eccentric press or whatever, the safety equipment must deactivate the primary control of that machine. So this is the, the offering from Maria. Um, in a nutshell, really, we've got the safety light curtains, uh, type two and type four, um, suitable for food and beverage with certain accessories and for refrigeration applications as we can go down to minus 30 degrees operating temperature on these light curtains. We've got the M1 and the M1S um, programmable safety controllers. Uh, you saw that in the video earlier, explained uh, their functionality. New to the catalog, we've got the safety interface modules. We'll be discussing some of these applications in the next few slides, as well as the uh, safety RFID, that's radio frequency ID switches, and uh, standard magnetic read switches, both safety type. Also new to the catalog. So starting with the EOS light curtains, this is on page K20. Um, a lot of people that I've spoken to about the light curtains don't understand that they have built in uh, automatic or manual uh, start and restart options. So often you don't need an extra controller to do this type of um, interlocking or start or restart. It's actually built into the light curtain. So as you can see from the drawing, by a simple bridge or, or push button, you can choose between those two options. And on the emitter side, also by bridging out or leaving open a, a certain input, you can choose between a low range or a high range. Um, so if you notice, the light curtains have selectable ranges, either four or 12 meter or three or six meter, depending on the, the spacing of the curtain themselves. The EOS4 light curtain, as you will see on page K20, is a PLE rated type curtain, and the EOS2 is a PLC. So the EOS4 obviously has extra circuitry, has extra monitoring equipment, has extra redundancies, which makes it a higher safety level curtain, and also obviously bumps up the price a little bit. Okay. So that's our EOS2 and the EOS4 type safety light curtains with built-in control. The light curtains have a PNP output. If you wanted to have a relay output instead of having the PNP output of the light curtains um, in a system, for instance, you would prefer to break the contactor signal for the press with a relay rather than trying to integrate uh, the PNP signal of the light curtain, then adding the ADSRO or ADSROA, they on page K22, and near the middle. These are just extension relays, basically, to the light curtain. Uh, standalone, there's no real safety um, specification of this relay. It adopts the safety standard of the connected light curtain. So if you're using an EOS4, it's PLE. If you're using an EOS2, it's a PLC system. This safety relay um, doesn't have any built-in control start or restart functions. Again, it relies on the light curtains restart or, or manual restart uh, functions. So there's a great option, uh, 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 economical option, if you want to add a relay output to your light curtain system. Also, another uh, extension of our light curtain systems would be the ADSRM, the muting module, uh, as well as uh, some muting sensors. So, as you can see from the little diagram below, you would have two retroreflective sensors, as we've discussed 
earlier, um, and they will form part of the muting of that light curtain. So the ADSRM will accept the, the, the sensors in, and if the sensors are made and, and, and broken at the correct uh, time, then it's a muting signal goes into the ADSRM, and it will mute the light curtains from um, triggering the, the output fault. Um, that's one way to achieve it. So that's the ADSRM, the muting module, with extra photoelectric uh, sensors to add that functionality to our standard EOS light curtains. RIA has a full safety offering. Um, too large for us to stock every single item. So with regards to the, to the muting, they have a specific uh, module as well. They call safe gate. This comes with built in muting arms that you can adjust up and down, depending on uh, where you want the, the muting action to happen. And all the photoelectric sensors are integrated into the receiver and the emitter. This obviously saves in, in time and installation that you don't have to align a, a lot of different sensors and, and also the wiring is a lot quicker. Um, we can provide the solution to you uh, so long as we understand your requirements, the exact requirements. Whereas the solution I mentioned previously is something that we can assemble out of stock. So having individual parts like photoelectric sensors and light curtains, uh, normal light curtains, um, it gives us the ability to supply immediately. But if you prefer something like a safe gate option, um, we have the, the facility to, to bring that in as well, so long as we know your exact requirements. That's RIA's safe gate with built-in muting function. Another new unit to the catalog is our safety uh, relay, the ADSRE4 and ADSRE4C. Uh, I imagine these to be the most popular, um, they have been the most popular thus far. Um, these are your typical standard uh, e-stop type um, safety relay modules. So you can see here there's two connection diagrams we can use. Um, we can get to PLD if we use a single contact, breaking the power in of the ADSRE4. Or a better solution, the normal solution really, is two normally closed contacts on the e-stop going into the um, dedicated input terminals of that safety relay and having the power permanently provided. You'll note that the, the unit ending in 4C is manual only. You do not have the option of restarting that safety circuit automatically. So if you don't want the option and you're scared someone might bridge out a, a certain input on the relay and make it automatic, you can choose the 4C, which is a manual only restart. You have to have that rising edge um, before the system would restart. Just a note on the door guarding solution. Um, our standard Lovato um, door switches, the safety type door switches, come with one normally open, one normally closed. To use the, the, the guard system with the um, ADSR E4 and two normally closed contacts, we would need to change the contact block of that system to the KXBL21. Um, if you look on page K31, you'll see all the, the safety limit switches there. This particular contact block is not in the catalog. Um, it is, however, on the system. So if you want to add the two normally opens, so we can use it in this configuration. Um, obviously, it'll be closed when the door is inserted. Then adding this contact block to the safeguard limit switch is another great option. So that's the ADSRE4 and ADSRE4C standard e-stop and safe gate uh, relay module, safety relay module. Another one uh, added to the, the catalog, another new one is the ADSR 
T. This is a dedicated to two hand control uh, stations. So you need to push two push buttons um, no longer than 0.5 seconds apart for the actual output to activate, um, say for the press to come down. Um, the buttons have to be released and pushed again to, to restart the cycle. You would need to add one normally open and one normally closed to each push button and wire it in this fashion so that the, the relay receives the right signal when the, when the push buttons are pressed. And we can get up to PLE in this setup. We actually had a client um, uh, in Belleville that we helped out with some light curtains. So they actually had two, two hand control stations um, and one operator per machine. Uh, what they actually did was put in light curtains and remove the push buttons uh, and then they they could have one operator operating two machines so instead of standing there with his fingers on two push buttons watching the press come down press hold seal and and up the operator could load apart press start walk away the light curtain is protecting the dangerous area he could turn around to the next press load another part press start go back to the first press and remove the part. Um, so in that case, they moved away from the two hand controls and went for the light curtain solution, basically freeing up the operator's hands to do more while he's waiting for this press to, to seal and, um, and obviously stamp the parts. So that was quite a nice little solution that they put together. Um, they, they got to double up their production by adding in light curtains instead of the two hand control. Onto our door switches, the RFID. These are also new to the catalog. You will see them on page K21, K22. RFID switches. These are particularly coded to, to work one receiver and, uh, and one actuator. Um, these can be wired individually back to the M1 or M1S. So if you want an individual channel from each safety gate on a machine wired into each particular, into each individual channel on the mosaic, then you can build the, the logic control inside the mosaic. If all the gates are open or one, one of the gates are open, trip out or don't trip that part of the machine out. In this system, you could, um, you could determine what causes an error if you wire each individual RFID back to a separate input on the safety controller. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to decide what happens when gate one, gate two, or gate three is opened. It's also possible to connect these RFID sensors in series. Uh, so if you wanted to reduce the amount of input channels used, um, and say if gate one, two, or three are opened, you want the same result to happen, you could series up these sensors um, and take one input into say an ADSR1 or an ADSRM. This is done by adding in certain Y connector M12 units. So you see a, a particular type of Y connector um, inserted would be able to have the input signal and the output signal transmitted to the next sensor. And, and by putting in a whole bunch of these um, series connections, you can series up to 30 devices in a row. Um, there's also special types of Y connectors if you needed to splice into the sensor and maybe extract um, a status LED. So you could have an LED on a particular door. If that door is open, the LED is on immediately, and that's from that particular sensor. Um, and you can also splice in a, an external device monitoring. So if an external system had to trip, you could force one of these door switches to trip as well, which will send a signal to the safety relay or the M1 and allow it to trip as well. So you could splice into the, the, the photoelectric RFID sensor with uh, 
with another type of Y-series connector. So this is a nice option if you have multiple RFID uh, sensors around your machine and you perhaps don't have a M1 unit and you want um, just a single channel uh, to, to break if any one of the doors are opened. This also the, 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 the Y-series connectors are not in the catalog, but I do have some pieces on order. One of the last units we're going to look at is the magnet safety switches. Um, these work with magnet, as the name suggests, and not radio frequency like the previous door switches. Um, so they are slightly more economical in price, uh, but they don't have the, effect, the options of series, seriesing units out or external device monitoring inputs to, to, uh, to add more um, features to the system. So these are basic read switches uh, that will feed back into a controller, ADSR, ADSR E4, or perhaps the, the main programmable M1 units. That's the Magnus read switches. They are on bottom of page K22. That's all from me. Um, thanks all who, who are watching. I do appreciate it. These are my contact details. If anyone wants to send me a, a follow-up or has any questions on uh, anything we've discussed, I'll be more than happy to help out um, where I can. Conrad, over to you. Oh. Uh, I hope everyone now understands why we call William the in-house Einstein. Um, as you can see, uh, quite, a, quite a complex topic. Um, we all sometimes kind of look at sensors and just go, it's a sensor. You know, there's a lot more to it than, than meets the eye. Thank you, William. Very, very insightful and informative. So, yeah. Coming up, webinar events hosted by EM. The next event on the 21st of June, uh, hosted by Christo van Rensburg, the product manager for power distribution, will focus on our H3 and smart molded circuit breakers. Um, something to look forward to if you're, if you're into building power distribution panels. Um, then on the 2nd of July, another Einstein artist will be presenting our power factor solutions. Um, Electromechanica manufactures and assembles its, its own range of power factor correction products. We incorporate Lovato and Electronicon products into the heart of the operation. Um, join Art uh, for an insightful and informative presentation on power factor correction and harmonics. Then on the 16th of July, um, Christo again will be presenting enclosures with a focus on Hager's Quadro flat pack enclosure options. It's a very flexible, um, easy to assemble system for panel builders who would like something off the shelf, where you do not want to wait for a sheet metal shop to, to stamp out and powder coat your, your products. You can assemble a, a rated enclosure off our shelf um, with options for various door options, um, insert options to house various components. It's a very comprehensive product. Conrad, we've got a, a hand in the field. Hmm. Uh, contact details for William again, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Olabador de Victor, top of the list. Would you like to talk, Mr. Victor? Yeah, I think he does. I'm struggling to unmute.
There you go. Hello, Mr. Victor. Hello, sir. I can hear you, sir. Yes, you're live. I can hear you. Please go ahead and do it. Yes, sir. No, I don't have questions for now, sir. No. I don't have questions. Okay, sorry. I'll just drop your hand in. Cool. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, we've got one from uh, John Creel. Um, do we have an ultrasonic level sensor that has a variable analog output from 2.5 to 5.5? The answer is no. When you, when you teach the sensor, it's, uh, if it's a 0 to 10 volt unit, it's taught uh, between, say, 0 and 100 millimeters at 0 to 10 volt, or 0 to 1 meter, 0 to 10 volt. To my knowledge, there's no way of uh, scaling that back. Um, John, maybe you can email me and, and elaborate why do you need uh, that control voltage. Maybe we can figure out uh, another solution for you. You can more than welcome to send me a private mail and we can discuss that. Maybe there's some other signal conditioner we can provide or, or some other solution there. Great. Before we start the poll, just to remind everybody that a copy of this presentation will be emailed through to everybody that attended and registered. Um, obviously, to watch at your convenience, there's a live recording as well. Um, but the static presentation would also be, be sent through to you. Um, thank you for attending. I'm going to activate the poll. Please take, take a few minutes. Um, To, to, to go through the poll. It really does help us bring to you topics and presentations that are engaging and will keep you going through the entire session. Try and make this lockdown life a little bit more manageable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, everybody. Stay safe. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for joining. Do appreciate it. Uh, see you next time.